All right, let's continue from where we left off. So we last time we're talking about the problems ADFA, EDFA, and EQDFA. So recall that the A means the acceptance problem, checking whether or not, so, so you, here we're always given a machine and an input and check whether the machine accepts the input. The E here is for emptiness. And we're always given a single machine and are asked to figure out whether or not its uh, language is empty. And then the EQ here is for the equality check. So here we're given two machines and we're asked to figure out whether or not they have the same language. And we saw last time that these are all decidable, meaning that there is an algorithm that always halts and outputs the right answer. So it would make sense then that we can start talking about this, the context-free versions of these problems, because I could just uh, talk about A sub NFA or regular expression, and there's an algorithm to convert from one to the other, so all of those problems are decidable too, so there's no real reason to talk about them. Okay, so let's talk about the context-free versions. Let's start with the acceptance problem. So ACFG, as you might expect, is we're given a grammar and an input. So G is a CFG and W is in the language of G. And because PDAs and CFGs have an algorithm to convert from one to the other, we might as well just talk about CFGs because if one of them is decidable, then the other one is decidable. So the problem here is that, well, we have to start with the start variable, but other than that, I don't know which rules to apply. And we may get stuck after a while, for example, like we have a variable S goes to A, A goes to B, and then we have a bunch of variables like X goes to Y, and then Y goes to uh, A, S or something, which would go back up to the top. Or... So we don't necessarily know very much about the structure of a uh, just a general CFG. But re recall that we had this one problem with CFGs, I think, on a lab or something, when we were talking about um, all strings. If we have a string W of length N, then uh, if G is in CNF and W is in the language of G, then we try, that, um, not we try, um, then W will take 2n minus 1 rule applications. Now, this result doesn't really tell us which rules to apply, but the fact is, if we have a grammar in CNF, then uh, if the string is in the language of the grammar, then some set of 2n minus 1 rule applications will work. Well, if it's the, the only exception to this is if um, w is equal to the empty string, then all we need to check if, is if s goes to empty at that point. Because if we have a grammar in CNF, the only way we could ever make the empty string is directly from the start variable. So, this doesn't actually tell us, well, in every other case, this doesn't tell us which set of 2n minus 1 to apply, but rather, let's just try all possibilities, because if none of them work, then there's no way we could ever make w at that point. So we're not going for efficiency here, we're just seeing if it is possible at all. And in fact, there is a much faster algorithm, I think called the CYK algorithm, which is, if you happen to know what dynamic programming is, uh, this uh, that it uses that heavily here. But let's just use a brute force strategy. So because we're trying to solve the ACFG problem, we're always going to be given input a grammar and an input string. Uh, 
So, so where G is a CFG and W a string. So the first step is to convert a G into a grammar. Uh, I'll call it a C in CNF. C standing for CNF, of course. And then we just check if W is equal to the empty string and uh, S goes to empty is a rule in C, then we should accept because um, that means that the empty string is in the language of the grammar because the start variable made empty directly. Um, and I should say that S is the start variable of C. If uh, S to empty is not a rule, then reject. Because if W is the empty string and there's no such rule of the form S goes to empty, then there's no way we could have ever made the empty string in the first place. So then otherwise, well, we are in the 2n minus 1 situation. So let's let n to be the length of the string w. And then let's generate all possible uh, derivations of length 2n minus 1. If any of them results in w, then that means that the grammar can make the string w, which means it's in the language of the grammar, so we should accept at that point. And then otherwise, if none of them works, well, then it can't possibly ever generate the string to start with, so therefore we should reject. Cool. And this is pretty obviously decidable because this step, first step, runs in a finite amount of time. There's an algorithm for it. Clearly step two runs in a finite amount of time. Three of course does. Four does because there are only finitely many rules and so the number of choices we can make of length 2n minus 1, well that's a finite number. It is a gigantic number but it's a finite number. And step five obviously runs in a finite amount of time. So a CFG is in fact decidable. And this implies that a sub PDA, where we're just checking if the PDA accepts the string, is decidable as well, because we can just convert the PDA to a CFG and then run the decider for a CFG on that CFG. Okay, cool. So then we got that one. Let's talk about the emptiness problem version for CFGs. So in this case, we have a single grammar, no input string. So G is a CFG. And uh, the language of G is empty. So the grammar doesn't do anything. So this is a little bit trickier because um, we can't just like say, oh, there's no way to get to a final state. Well, because you may think, okay, let's just convert this to a PDA and then just see if you can reach a start, uh, reach a final state from the start state. The problem with that is that the stack contents may change which transition we take. We can't just view the PDA as a directed graph and then find out if it's possible to reach a final state. So we have to do something a little bit more clever. So we're going to use a strategy that's kind of similar to the nullable variables idea, where in the conversion to CNF like we use here, we check if a variable can make the empty string, and then we do a recursive uh, definition based off of that. We'll do something uh, uh, simple here. So what we're going to say is a variable uh, x is productive if x can make a string 
of terminals. If it can make any string of just terminals or empty string, I guess, then uh, it's productive. So we just want to check that. So what we're doing here is reducing this to the problem. Is the start variable productive? And if it isn't, then we know that the grammar's language is empty. And if it is productive, then we know the grammar's language is not empty. So what we can do here, let's see. So let's mark every variable. Yeah, so let's mark every variable that explicitly makes a string of terminals as productive. And then, so let's see. So if we have a rule, let's just say x goes to um, w1 a, w2 b, w3, and then some other variables, um, y, wn, or something. And what do I mean by this? So where all of the wi's here, so these are only terminals. So if we have a rule like this where all of the others, like the a, b, y, and all those are variables, so then if a, b, all of the variables on the right hand side are productive, mark x as productive. Why can we do that? Because we know that if we know, for example, all the variables are productive and everything else is a terminal, then x itself can be can make a terminal. So then all we need to do is just repeat this procedure until no new variables are marked. So initially we go through the variables and just mark them as productive and we're going to make a pass through the rules and mark any variables as productive along the way that haven't been marked as productive. And at some point we're going to run out of new variables to mark because there are only finitely many variables. So that means that we only have a finite number of iterations here because there are only finitely many variables and at some point we're going to run out of variables to mark. Either there are no variables left to mark or all of the ones that are not marked uh, should not be marked. And then all we ask the question is at the end uh, determine uh, whether the start variable was marked or not. And if it was marked as being productive, then the grammar's language is not empty, so we should reject at that point. And if it was not marked, then that means that the grammar's language is empty, which means we should accept. So, and here, therefore, we should output the opposite answer. Okay, so output the opposite answer because if it was marked, then the language is not empty of the grammar, which means that we should reject. So if it is marked, we reject. And if it was not marked, we accept, which means that we output the opposite answer. And this is uh, a decider because there are only finitely many rules and finitely many variables, so we have a finite number of iterations of finite amount of work each. So therefore, this tells us that ECFG is decidable. And for the same reason as, last as the last problem, EPDA is decidable too. Because we can just convert the PDA to a CFG and then run the decider for ECFG. Cool.
So let's see. Then let's talk about the equality problem. So EQCFG is um, all the grammars G1, G2, where G1, G2 are CFGs, and the language of G1 is the language of G2. They have the same, they do the same thing. And you may think, well, let's just use strategy that we did for DFAs, which is using that Venn diagram idea. And then we shade in these two parts, and then we take the symmetric difference of the two sets, which is, let's just say that this is the language of G1, language of G2 over here. And then we just say, let's make the grammar for uh, L of G1 intersection L of G2 complement, union, the language G1 complement, uh, yeah, yeah, intersection, language of D2. And then we just ask the, uh, ants make the grammar for that, and then check it at the end, is that equal to the empty set? And we know that the emptiness test is decidable. But here's the problem. Context-free grammars are not, uh, context-free languages are not closed under complement. So there's not a guarantee here that these are CFLs. We do not know uh, whether or not these are context-free grammars. We could do that with regular languages because they have closure under complement. Um, and even more so, um, even if they were, we can't guarantee anything about closure under intersection because CFLs are not closed under intersection. So that does not say that this is impossible uh, to do. Um, it just shows that this particular method is, uh, uh, it doesn't work. It, the method of using the DFA symmetric difference idea doesn't work. So the thing is, it turns out that this is not decidable. But we don't have the technology yet to actually prove that. And that actually is a stark contrast between the um, DFA decidability problems and the CFG ones. So um, what you should do is uh, at least try to figure out why would it not be decidable? What are some reasons? Why would it be hard to show that this is decidable? Are there some ways that you can try to decide it? But unfortunately, it's not decidable. So and we will eventually deal with that if there's time, hopefully, in the, in the remaining classes. Okay, so then let's talk about the the Turing machine versions of the three problems. So ATM is the starting one. So here we have a Turing machine and an input W. So M is a Turing machine and W is in the language of the Turing machine. And um, so before we can tackle the decidability question of this one, what we should do is try to get recognizable first. So recall that decidable means that the Turing machine will always halt, and recognizable means it just halts on the strings in the language and doesn't have to halt on the strings not in the language. So how can we show this here? And, and just to uh, make this a little bit more clear, Decidable problems are in here, and recognizable problems are, are enclosing it. They may be the same. It may be possible that every decidable language is recognizable and the other way around. But we haven't shown that they're different or the same yet. So, But we know that every decidable language is recognizable. That's true. So let's try to get recognizability first. So remember... Um, if we get a string mw here that encodes a machine and an input, we need to halt and, and say the right answer for the strings in the language, which means that it is a Turing machine and 
the machine accepts it. So let's see. Let's try this. So on input MW, where M is a Turing machine and W a string. So let's try this. Let's run M on W. Just simulate the, the Turing machine on input W. Nothing special there. Well, the problem here that could arise is the machine could run forever. Well, suppose it did run forever. Is it possible then that it runs forever and is accepted by the, the Turing machine? Well, the answer is no, it can't. We have the condition that is in the language of the machine, which means it hits the accept state at some finite amount of time. So if it is in the language of the machine, it will stop at some point. So if M accepts W, which it, if it really is that case, then it will hit step two at some point. Then we need to say accept. Uh, otherwise, reject. Well, let's see, what are the three behaviors that can happen? Well, either the machine accepts W, which means we accept. It, uh, the second case is that it outright rejects W directly uh, in some finite amount of time, which means we reject here, so we say the right answer there. Or it runs forever, but that means we don't accept, which is perfectly fine because we just not we just want to show that it's recognizable. And we do because we accept on the strings in the language. The the strings MW that are inside ATM. So all the strings that encode a machine and an input where the Turing machine accepts that input. So ATM is in fact recognizable. So uh, what about decidable? So, oh, is ATM decidable? Well, we clearly can't use the approach that we just did because um, the first step could run for an infinite amount of time because the machine's not required to halt. So uh, it may be possible that we could just use some other approach that looks inside the Turing machine and tries to make a determination of what it actually does. So it turns out that the answer, unfortunately, is no. So what we'll show here is that ATM is undecidable. So in other words, if you have a computer program and you want to know what it does, if it's just some arbitrary program that you don't know anything about, then um, and you're presented it as input, then it's not possible to determine if it will say yes on an input or something, whether it'll accept or not. So let's try to prove this. So this is our first un undecidable problem, and believe me, there will be more. Um, although they will be a lot easier to prove than this. So what I recommend here is that the proof is actually one of the most complicated things in the whole class. So what I would recommend is to try to just understand it at a high level as we go through and then watch it again and then try to understand it at a deeper level. So the way that we're going to go about doing this is by contradiction. So the way that we'll uh, actually do that is we're going to suppose that some machine H decides ATM. So we're just supposing that it was decidable and, and H decides ATM, which means that it gets an input MW and it will always halt. Then what we'll try to do is derive a contradiction. So what we want is to derive a contradiction which means that H cannot possibly have been a decider for ATM, which means that it's undecidable. So how do we do that? Well, what we should do here is let's try to understand what H does. 
So what H does is it gets input MW, some input MW, and since it's a decider, it either does one of two things. It accepts, it says accept, or it says reject. It cannot run forever because we assumed it was a decider. So if, it's, if it says accept, that means if it does that if M accepts W, and it says reject if M does not accept W. I don't say reject here because it might be that a case that H figured out that M runs forever on input W. So I say does not accept to mean either reject or runs forever on. So what I'm going to do here is we're going to build a Turing machine I'm going to call D uh, as follows. And the construction of D only de really depends on what H does. So here's what D is going to do. So D, the only purpose of this machine D is to help us derive a contradiction. It's not, it doesn't have any real purpose. So its only, its only purpose is to help us derive a contradiction. So the way this machine is going to work is it's going to receive a single machine and nothing else, no input here, where M is a Turing machine. And what is its first step? Well, we're going to run H, this decider, supposed decider, for ATM. Well, remember what ATM is. ATM uh, requires a machine and an input, and an input string. So we're going to run H on, well, we got to give it two things. We got to give it a machine and an input string. So what is the input string going to be? Well, in this case, we're going to feed it the string of M, the string encoding of M. So in other words here, we're going to run, uh, because we don't know what H does, we're not really sure whether M actually runs on that input, but we're going to run M on its own encoding. You may think, what in the world? But the string encoding the machine is, is a perfectly valid string, and I'm just building this machine. I'm not saying that it has any real purpose other than to derive a contradiction. And then what we're going to do is step two is output the opposite of what uh, H says. So if, M, if H said accept, D is going to say reject. And if H says reject, D says accept. So it does the exact opposite of what H does. So let's try to see what it actually, what D actually does. And we're really, really close here, believe it or not. So D is going to get some input M, a, a string encoding a machine. Well, let's note what D does. Well, step two runs in a finite amount of time, clearly. And step one runs in a finite amount of time on the supposition that H is a decider. So D, again, like H, will say accept or reject. It can't run forever because it, it runs in a finite amount of time. So when does D say accept here? Well, if D says accept, H, since it did the opposite, must have said reject. Well, that means here that M does not accept uh, its own uh, encoding. And if it says reject here, well, H did the exact opposite, which means that since it decided ATM, that means that M does, if M accepts its encoding. Maybe I'll get rid of the word does to make it a little clearer. So if M, so it will say accept if M uh, accepts its own descript 
Yeah. So it's doing the exact opposite of what H did. It's liter it's literally just doing the opposite. So why does this help us? Well, D is a decider for some language. We we don't really care what the language is, but it's a decider. It runs in a finite amount of time. So no matter what machine we give it, it must say the right answer. So let's feed D on its own description, its own encoding. Well, since it's a decider, it must take an arbitrary Turing machine because that's what we are doing here. We're just giving it an any old Turing machine. Well, its own string must be a perfectly, it's a perfectly valid Turing machine. So let's see. Well, either one of two things occurs. So it either says accept or reject. So let's see. Well, it says accept. Well, here we had an M here, and now we have a D. So every place that we have M over here, let's just substitute in D. So it says accept if D does not accept D. Wait a minute. D on its own description, set, on its own encoding, says accept if it does not accept its own encoding. Okay, let me, okay, maybe something went wrong. Let's try the other one. Um, it says reject if D accepts D. Wait, so D rejects its own encoding if D accepts its own encoding? Wait, so we just said that D was a decider, but that clearly can't be the case here because on this one input, it must do the opposite thing of whatever it did. So, But it either does one of the two things. It can't do both. So this is a contradiction. So this implies D um, can not exist because um, it can't say the exact opposite of what it actually did. Um, yeah, it, it can't accept and not accept at the same time. Which, well, how did we build the Turing machine D in the first place? Well, step two, well, that that's not, that, that could be done with any Turing machine. But step one relies only on this decider H. If H doesn't exist, I can't build the machine D at all. So that means that H cannot exist. Which means that ATM is undecidable because we assumed that H was a decider for ATM. Cool. So I realized that was a quite a complicated proof, but the basic idea is that we're doing this by contradiction. Supposing a machine did decide it, then we build a, a weird machine that um, does the opposite and uh, of whatever the ATM decider H says, but we make sure to have it run on its own inputs, uh, its own encoding to be its, the input that we give it. And then uh, here, then we get a contradiction on a particular Turing machine, which is its own self. So the way that this proof goes, if you've ever heard of this term is called diagonalization. So basically all it means is that the Turing machine is completely, it does different behavior than every other Turing machine, including itself, which means that it cannot exist. And we were only able to build and to have that contradiction if we have a supposed decider for ATM, but, uh, but since we got the contradiction, that decider cannot exist. Okay, cool. So then ATM is undecidable, but we showed above that it was recognizable. So what this actually shows us is that there is a language right here called ATM. There is a language that's recognizable, but not decidable. Cool. So uh, let's see. So we're going to look at a, a proof that allows us to fully categorize what languages are. So you may be thinking, okay, look at this um, uh, 
the, the, these circles right here with decidable and recognizable, you may be thinking, well, is there a language out here outside of recognizable entirely? Well, we got a language, that, a bunch of languages in, in the decidable category. We have one right now in the recognizable but not decidable category, but is there one that's not recognizable at all? And what we're going to do is actually prove that one exists there. So here's what we're going to prove right here. We're going to prove that L is decidable, a language L is decidable, if and only if L is recognizable and L complement is recognizable. And uh, so why is this significant? Well, we know that ATM is undecidable and ATM is recognizable because we did that. So this one is not true. This one is true. But then that means that L bar is not recognizable. So ATM bar is not recognizable. So as a uh, corollary, so a result that follows from this one, ATM bar is not recognizable. And for that same reason, um, since every decidable language is recognizable, this, shall, this clearly shows that ATM bar is also not decidable because it's outside of the bigger bubble, so it must be outside the little bubble. Okay, so how do we prove this? So let's do the forward direction first. So this says that if we have L a decidable language and then a want to show L is I'll short, shorten it to REC and for recognizable and L bar is rec, recognizable as well. Well, the, the first one is immediate because every decidable language is recognizable. We've seen that already. What about L bar? Well, think about what decidable means. It always halts on every single input string. So um, L decidable, oops, L decidable, so I'll shorten this to DEC, implies L bar decidable because just swap Q accept and Q reject. And why could we do that? Well, since the language is decidable, uh, swap uh, these two for a Turing machine deciding L. I should be uh, more careful about that. We got to uh, swap the states in the Turing machine, not in the language. Um, if L is decidable, L bar is decidable because since the Turing machine always halt, so it either goes to Q accept or Q reject for every string, well then if we swap the two um, in the Turing machine itself, well, every string must still go to Q accept or Q reject, but now it's going to the opposite one. So, um, that actually shows us that decidable languages are closed under complement because we can swap the those two states. So then uh, because of that, L bar decidable implies that L bar is recognizable. So that's pretty easy. Now let's do the other direction. So here we have L uh, recognizable and L bar recognizable. So then we want to, oops, we want to show uh, L decidable. Well, let's see. So now we actually uh, have a little bit of an issue that's easily fixed. So here we have actually two different recognizers. So maybe let's have a recognizer called R here. And for L bar, we have a recognizer R, uh, R bar to, um, to recognize those. Well, let's see. If I run an input string on, say, R, for example, the recognizer for L, well, since it's just a recognizer, it might not halt if the string is not in the language. Um, 
But if it is in the language, it must halt because it's a recognizer. Um, similarly for our bar. But the key thing to note here is that either this one or this one must halt and say accept at some point. Um, I don't know which one of these two it is, but one of them must halt because it's either every string is either in the language L or its complement. I don't know which one, but it's always in one of the two. So let's build a decider uh, D as uh, oops. Let's build a decider D. D for L as follows. So, uh, so this decider must halt on every input string. It must halt. So on input W, well, we can't just run R or just R bar, but what we're going to do is we're going to run each of R, R bar for one step each on w more one more step actually i'll put more on this side one more step each on w so let's see if r accepts w then we need to say accept because that means that since r is the recognizer for l and we're trying to decide l we should say the same answer if um, our bar accepts w at this point, then we need to say reject because our bar is trying to recognize l complement, but we're trying to build a decider for the language l, not the complement. So we should do the opposite. And then if we didn't get into one of those two steps, we need to go back to step one. And then go again for one more step, and then check one, uh, if either one accepted W. Um, and we can guarantee that this halts because one of the two is a it must say accept on that input string at some point. I don't know whether it's R or R bar, but one of the two must halt. And so therefore, we have a decider because at some point one of these two steps will occur and uh, I don't know the number of steps it takes but it's some finite number because it accepts the string so therefore we have a decider D for L once we know that there's a recognizer for L and its complement so the thing that we should note here is that ATM bar is not recognizable for that reason Okay, so let's actually take a look at where we are right now. We started off with the regular languages, and then we started talking about CFLs, and every regular language is context-free. Then we have decidable languages here. And then outside of that bubble, we have the recognizable languages. And so like an example of a regular language would be like empty set for sigma star. A CFL that's not regular would be like uh, 0 to the n, 1 to the n, where n is at least 0. Um, a CFL that is a language that is decidable but not a CFL would be something like 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n. And I invite you to think about how you actually decide that language but it's certainly not context-free. A language that is recognizable but not decidable, we just learned, is ATM. And a language that's not even recognizable is ATM bar. So what we're going to start talking about next time is how to prove other languages to be undecidable. And you may be thinking, okay, well, how many languages are out here in this area? And it, unfortunately, it turns out to be the vast majority of languages. The vast majority of languages are not even recognizable. Only a vanishingly small fraction of languages are within, this, uh, within these bubbles here.
So we'll talk about that next time, and I'll see you then.